Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We are working through every company in S&P 500 and today is CBOE Global Markets Incorporated, ticker CBOE. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts about the valuation of this company and its business quality. This company operates in the capital markets industry, has a market cap of $11 billion, EV of $12.5 billion, a little bit of leverage but not much here. Um, it operates as an options exchange worldwide. Okay, so exchanges tend to be pretty good businesses. They have listed in market indices. They have North American equity segments trading in the U.S. and Canadian markets. Um, ETP listings are future segments, um, Europe and Asia. So they have global coverings of this company, strategic relationships with S&P Dow Jones indices, um, FTSE and Elasher, Frank Russell Company, MSC, DGI. And so that gives you a little bit of a remnant. So the first thing we see here is beta 0.62 is actually significant because that's a low number um, for the S&P 500. Anything that much below one is showing it's relatively um, less volatility, it tends to be a better business. The next thing, so we see this is at 0% in 2008. So we're gonna take that out of the consideration for our data set here. <laughs> but if you do that, then every year we have data for, since 2009, the company has made a profit. And so, Profitability in every year is a very, very positive sign for business quality. In addition, your returns on invested capital are amazing in some of these years. 2009, 37%, 54%, 67%. It stays in the 60s for four years before going to 70%, 80%, 64%. Now, it drops to 17% in 2017, which I'm a little interested to see what happens. It looks like they made some sort of acquisition or something because you jumped in revenue from $703 million to $2.2 billion. Um, and it dropped down to 17%, 9%, 8%, 10%, 10%. So the return on invested capital dropped to a much lower number. But if I had to guess, a lot of that is goodwill because what probably happened is they made a big acquisition. There's a lot of goodwill here, but if it's a similar business, then they probably have very little um, in the actual true tangible invested capital. Um, but these are these are really, really good numbers. Everything looks incredibly high quality here. Also look at the stability. It's either increasing or stable. Increasing or stable for the most part. You have an acquisition here, so that's distorting it. But even in this year's, it's basically increasing or stable. Very, very good numbers. You're hitting that double-digit return on invested capital. Over the last decade, you have these 44% type returns, which are just amazing. Gross profits getting above that very important 50% number. Um, very solid. You like to see that. Um, they do drop over time. It looks like you had 91% at the beginning of the decade. You're down in that 30, 34% range. So this actually doesn't tell you that much because it's not near these numbers. Clearly, they acquired something with much lower gross margins that does affect what we're seeing in this business. But overall, you, you like to see these numbers. Now, the PE of 23.2, you begin to ask, okay, is it worth that? Well, does look like a high quality company. High quality companies tend to trade close to a PE of 20 versus a PE of like five. So you need certain level of revenue and asset growth to justify that. But you have that. You have 21% revenue growth, 35% asset growth, 12% earnings per share growth over the course of the decade. Very, very strong numbers. Now, this is being distorted due to this acquisition, um, which again, we'll probably get to see a little bit more with some from other numbers later. But this asset is probably when we get to it in tangibles. And so I really like seeing this revenue growth, this EPS growth, double digits, that can really drive a lot of value. Now I'd like to get the company cheaper, you know, 15 to 20 range on this PE, but overall I'm seeing a high quality company that's just trading on the little bit expensive side, but it might be justified. Because when you look at this EPS, you go from $1.78 to $5 per share. So you're basically tripling over the course of a decade. If you triple your earnings per share over a decade, that's a great business. You're going to do really, really well if you can keep doing that. Because that means maybe a decade from now, instead of $5 per share in 2032, maybe you're earning $15 per share. And you think about that, now you're trading at like six times earnings of what you'd have um, in a decade. And so then, you know, even if it's, you know, that's triples and it goes to 18 times earnings, you can have a very, very good return. And that triple over the course of a decade is what you want to see. So you have some forgiveness for this high valuation ratio if you can sustain that sort of growth. Now, the big question is going to be is can they sustain that growth without future acquisitions? And so we need to really dive into the balance sheet and come statement to learn more. If you're enjoying this video, please hit that like button. Please subscribe. When you subscribe and ring the bell, you get notifications as I upload new videos each and every week covering the companies in the S&P 500 and other investing topics. So income statement. Let's see. Well, first, I'm going to start on the balance sheet because I want to see this acquisition or 
And this is what you do see. Bam. You got 2.7 billion in goodwill, 1.9 billion in other intangible assets. This acquisition basically added $18 million in PP&E, but it, you know, put four to five billion dollars in assets on this. Yeah, basically four and a half billion dollars in intangible assets were added to the balance sheet. And that massively changes um, the returns on capital that you're seeing. But the true returns on this PP&E is is really what matters. And so if we compare this income statement, we say, okay, we're earning 500 million. Let's call it, yeah, $500 million in net income. Okay, and we compare that net income to the balance sheet. Now, that 500 million in net income is being compared to this asset base of six and a half billion. So you say, okay, well, maybe that's an eight, nine percent return on assets. But the tangible assets is less than $500 million. I mean, you have some accounts receivable, but this is cash, cash, some other current assets. I don't really know what that is. But um, you might have maybe half a million dollars in true assets, maybe a billion dollars, but you're still talking about a 50% return on your tangible assets is still taking place in the underlying business. The difference is, is what this chart is showing now is kind of your return on acquisition price. And so that's why we have this much lower number, but the true business is still running in this higher 50% range. And you don't really know that until you dive into these financial statements, but it's the value of doing that that's really important. Now, what I don't like is you did get diluted. So you made this acquisition, but you had to get diluted 20, 20 to 30% in order to do that. You went from 81 million shares outstanding to 170 million shares outstanding. In order to make that acquisition, they had to dilute you. So you issued common stock as part of that acquisition. In addition to spending some of your cash, you also issued debt. All this plays into how you get to that acquisition and where you got it. Now, they were able to issue those shares and then still grow shares outstanding. So clearly it was accretive. It was still a good acquisition. You went from $2.27 per share in earnings. You went issued 30% more shares and you still increased the EPS by 50%. So clearly it was an acquisition that made sense, um, but also that drives a big part of the numbers you're seeing here. So you need to take that into account. Now, since that acquisition, they're basically flat on shares outstanding. Before the share acquisition, they were declining shares outstanding. And you do have some declining shares outstanding since 2018. So they do apparently like to buy back shares. Let's see, you can see that because they're making pretty continuous buybacks throughout the decade. And so that's really good to see. You do have some stock-based compensation. I'm not sure exactly what this is, executives or anything. Um, but because the net issuance of shares is always out, you know, beating that, you're having the numbers stay stable or go down. I like that they're not diluting you because this is a really good business. You don't want to be diluted in a really, really good business. Um, you want to see that stay down. They're not adding a lot to your asset base, um, which is good to see as well. Do they have any pension liabilities? No, pension liabilities. So I like everything I see here. I think this company is definitely going on my watch list. The big questions for me is, what is the growth rates going to be in the future? Because you had this massive growth rate during the acquisition. You might've had another acquisition here in 2018. But you had some pretty jumpy um, revenue growth here. It's kind of hard to predict what you're doing. So regardless though, th this is looking really, really good. I like what I see. I'm unsure what the growth rate is in the future. Um, even this 5 7% growth rates, 10% growth rates is really good. So if you can sustain that sort of thing in the future, that's going to be a strong um, performer. But I would like it cheaper. I'd like to get it for under a PE of 20. So I'd say this company is a little overvalued, but it's definitely a very, very, very high quality company. Um, CBOE Global Markets will go on my watch list. Um, any type of like stock exchange is a really good business. This one's not in is options. So they're being affected a little bit, you know, probably by the Robin Hood stuff, everything going on with stimulus checks. Some of that is playing in. But the stock exchange business, very, very strong business. There's not many out there. This one operates in the options market. But overall, I like what I see. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. Please subscribe. Your subscriptions help to drive the growth in the channel. Your likes help to tell the YouTube algorithm that, hey, my content's good. So if you're enjoying my content, please hit that like button. Each and every video you watch, nothing else can help me to grow the channel faster. So thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.